When I first got here, I was trying to really make sense of the organization. What did they really want from Incutel? And the big epiphany that I had was this idea that in the traditional venture business, how do I get the highest quality deal flow? You don't worry about quantity because the quantity is just like noise in the system. The government agencies wanted from us was both quantity and quality. You know, they wanted to see everything, but they also want to see the highest quality tech that this country was developing, which I happen to believe was resonant with venture back startup companies. This is All Quiet on the Second Front, a podcast where boring conversations around defense tech and national security come to die. Join me, Tyler Sweat, and my Second Front comrades as we dismantle the mundane, cut through the bureaucratic BS to demystify the world of defense tech. But be warned, this is not a typical government podcast. Ready to get weird? All right, what's up, everybody? Uh, Welcome to another episode of All Quiet on the Second Front, the podcast where boring defense talk comes to die. Uh, I am your host, Tyler Sweat. Uh, Excited to be joined today by a colleague, friend, partner, you know, exemplar of sort of like American exceptionalism and and, uh, innovation, Steve Bauscher. Um, I'm going to let Steve do his intro and all of that. but I'll say I'm very excited for the conversation, given your career and where you sit and your vantage point on everything from sort of the global economics and the geopolitical down to the venture and the tech operators and the government sort of mission use case. That whole intersect, all of those complicated roads kind of drive right through you. Um, so thanks a bunch for taking some time to come hang out today. Well, thank you, Tyler. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, you and I have talked about these topics a lot over the years, and, and so it'll be fun uh, uh, to share with everybody else. Heck yeah. So I've had the, you know, as you alluded to, we, we've had the benefit of knowing each other for quite some time. For folks out there that might not be as familiar with you, kind of give everybody the, the who is Steve, what's your career kind of look like, what are you doing now, and, and sort of what's the organization? Sure. So uh, I actually grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm one of the few people that is proud to be born in, in D.C. I was at George Washington University Hospital. And I grew up with my dad working 20 years for the federal government. And a lot of my friends' parents were working for government. I went off to college, uh, came back and worked for a government consulting firm for two years in Roslyn. And sort of thought that was going to be my life. I was going to live in D.C. I think it's uh, one of the greatest cities in the world. And uh, I was going to sort of do stuff sort of government related. But when I did that government consulting uh, job for two years, I, I figured out I liked the business aspect of what I did more than the public sector aspect of what I was doing. So I decided to go out and get an MBA and rebrand myself more as a business person because I sort of decided I was going to head down that path a little bit more. And so I went out to California, Silicon Valley, to get my MBA. And I um, uh, thought I was going to be a two-year California vacation. I was going to head right back to D.C. because I, I had a, r- a really fun time from like Friday at 5 to Monday at 9 uh, uh, when I was living in D.C. And I wanted to continue that. But when I got out to Silicon Valley, I fell in love with the whole entrepreneurial nature of Silicon Valley and this world of uh, startups, you know, which, you know, sort of scratched every itch that I got from public sector consulting, right? You know, like everything you do matters in a startup company. Like you're incredibly connected to the customer. You get as much responsibility as an employee that you can demonstrate up until the point where you demonstrate you can't handle it more because, you know, there's just so much to do in a, in a startup company. And it was dynamic and fast paced, and I could wear shorts and a t shirt. And, you know, I was like, you know, wow, this sounds awesome. Uh, uh, uh. This is way better than a suit and tie all day. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, so, um, uh, 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 so I worked for three different startup companies uh, coming out of business school in all in Silicon Valley. And I always like to joke one went out of business, one got bought, one went public. So I had the whole spectrum That's of outcomes. That's the trifecta. And then, um, you know, along the way, I'd gotten some exposure to what uh, uh, venture capitalists uh, um, uh, did. And so I stayed in touch with a few different firms. And, you know, in January of 1999, when uh, we were at the tail end of a bull uh, market in the venture uh, capital, uh, you know, sort of cycles, which is a great time to get a job, right? Because, you know, firms are raising new funds with, you know, uh, uh, larger and larger amounts of money under management, and they need more people to help uh, put that money to work. Um, I got an offer from a firm called Interwest Partners to join to do, you know, uh, some combination of uh, uh, e-commerce and uh, enterprise software in- investing for them. And I took that and moved over. Uh, to the venture side in uh, January 1999. 
Now, the tail end of a bull market is a great time to get a job in venture, uh, uh, but it's a tough time to like keep your job. Uh, uh, <laughs> Preservation <in venture. laughs> is another story there. <laughs> exactly, yeah. right? Because um, you know you tend to be investing in companies at high prices in, 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 you know, at that part of the cycle, and they come to fruition in terms of when they generate liquidity in a bear market, right? And that's, you know, so, um, you know, uh, 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 job number one is to keep your job, right? You know, and I was, I was able to do that. But as you hit sort of 2003, 2004, a lot of people in the venture industry, and I was no exception, were trying to figure out how do you differentiate yourself as an investor? How do you figure out a strategy that will make sense in, in sort of a, an environment where people were thinking, I think correctly, that Fortune 1000 was not going to buy a ton of enterprise software because they just bought all this stuff in the 90s that they hadn't really gotten value from, that a lot of it was sitting on the shelf. And so I went back to my roots and I remember that the US government used to be a large buyer of IT products and services, but it was never a a vertical market that any of the companies I was looking at were pursuing. I should say, ask myself that question, huh, why is... uh, uh, why is that not the case? And so I surveyed the CEOs in my portfolio and said, hey, I'm going to spend some time digging around uh, D.C. trying to figure out how to help startup companies sell to the U.S. government. Is anybody interested in exploring that with me? A guy named Chris Darby raised his hand, who was CEO of a company that I, I'd invested in. So again, we'd recruited Chris to be this, the CEO of. And so Chris and I uh, spent some time here in D.C. trying to figure that out. We met Inkytel through that process. Inkytel was all set to invest in Sarvega. Uh, uh, next round of financing when instead we sold Sarvega to Intel Corporation. And uh, uh, I continued to sort of kick this general you know, idea on space around when uh, Chris had to do his sort of year of purgatory at Intel after the acquisition to make sure it went through. And he calls me up and says, hey, not, uh, and this is about nine months into his 12 months, I got a call about being CEO of Intel. What do you think? And so we went through the pros and cons of that. And then two weeks later, he calls me back and he goes, listen, you know, there's a CEO job in D.C., there's a managing partner job in uh, Menlo Park, which runs the investment team for Inkytel. There's been some friction between those two parts of the organization before. How about we do this together? You know, I'm in D.C., you're in Menlo Park, and because of our personal relationship, you know, we're going to keep those uh, two parts of the organization completely aligned. And I said, well, you know, you're going to change jobs anyway, so you go first. So he went in uh, August of 2006. <laughs> uh, uh, Jump in the water uh, right, and yeah. tell me how the pool is, Chris. <laughs> exactly, and he, and, and he took this job as CEO. And uh, in November of uh, 2006, I followed him and, and became managing partner. And so I've been at Inkytel for over 17 years now, uh, 16 of which, first 16, I was basically the number two person at Inkytel, and they've changed my title along the way to president. But when Chris stepped down last year, uh, the board saw fit to kick me upstairs and, and, and make me CEO. So I've been uh, officially CEO since uh, September of uh, 2023. So I've been at this organization for that long a period because I just love the mission of Inkytel. So one, I mean, it's just an, an amazing sort of journey where I think a lot of folks listening are going to see themselves in different parts of it, which yeah. is just interesting for like 800 different reasons. Yeah. Given that and sort of given where you sit now, you know, looking back over the last, you know, 17 years, what, what sort of surprised you? Like what's one of those one or two things that were those big aha surprise? It doesn't have to be like a swan or red or black swan, but... What are some of those big memorable things? Right. So I think um, uh, a couple of things that stick out to me. You know, first was when I first got here, I was trying to really make sense of the organization and what the what what we call the customers, which are the government partners that fund us, the government agencies. What did they really want from Inkytel? And the big epiphany that I had a few months in, I wrote. You know, I remember having it as I was flying out here to D.C. and wrote this whole, you know, uh, big email back then. You couldn't send it, so I had to, like, <laughs> store it and send it the next day. But um, was this idea that, you know, in the traditional venture business, you always think about uh, uh, deal flow in terms of quality. How do I get the highest quality deal flow, right? And you don't worry about quantity because quantity is just, like, noise in the system, right? You know, but what I realized that um, – uh, the government agencies wanted from us was both quantity and quality, right? You know, they wanted to see everything, you know, because they have all sorts of different, like, you know, out of the box reasons for why they might want to work with a company, right? But they also want to see the highest quality tech that this country was developing, which I happen to believe uh, was resonant within venture back uh, uh, startup companies. So the first real sh- thing change that I made when I, I came here was to copy a couple of very successful investment platforms, TA Associates and Summit Partners, that have been long-term successful firms, 
And they used to have a group of people that uh, back in the uh, uh, day used to be known as dialing for dollars or dialing for deals, I should say. So they uh, had a group of associates that would just outbound cold call companies to learn more information about them to figure out whether they were worthy of being an investment candidate. Back then, most investment firms were very reactive. They would just look at deal flow that came across their desk. And TA Summit were, were really the best in the business as far as I was concerned at proactively going out and generating deal flow. And so I created an, uh, a part of our investment organization at Enkitel that did just that. Now, over time, it evolved into cold emailing, right? You know, and then eventually uh, signaling and <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 direct messaging and, you know, some form or another, these companies. But I really, I think, helped drive Enkitel towards this idea of like, we need to proactively go out and see everything, you know, and we created uh, this process called a meeting note where we write up a meeting note uh, for every company that we meet with. And, and, uh, and that meeting note gets sent around to all the different agencies uh, that are funding us. So so all of a sudden, the agencies were seeing every, everything that we were seeing. So, so that was one thing. The next thing I would say is uh, the epiphany that we've had was that we thought that Maybe originally, Enkitel thought that it was in the matchmaking service, right? You yeah. know that, that it thought that you know, hey, we need to find a company that, that has see good technology, type right? Thing. You know, and an end user that has a problem that you know yeah. there's a match, and, and all we had to do was uh, create that match, and we were done. And what we realized was the real inhibition to a successful adoption of early emerging technology by end users within the intelligence community wasn't so much finding the match, but but breaking down all the barriers to when you see that match, actually getting it deployed in mission operational environment, right? And so I would argue the secret sauce of Inkytel isn't the stuff we do on the pre-deal side of finding uh, technologies and companies, although I think we're pretty good at it. But the secret sauce of Inkytel is what we do post-deal. And we throw all these bodies at this problem of reducing friction and figuring out, okay, a company, here's what you need to do, and user, here's what you need to do. And there's all these stupid things that come up that, that could break down. Like we had one situation where a company decided to change its pricing model, right? And now it's changing its pricing model. The customer wasn't really good at understanding, you know, early stage commercial technology and how they price things. And they heard about it and they're like, oh my gosh, there's no way we could ever afford uh, this technology. We want to stop this, you know, relationship right now. You know, and, and we, and, and left to their own devices, that deal would have completely fallen apart and there would have been no what we call solution transfer, the deployment of technology mission operation, right? And we were able to go in and sort of say, hey, end user, this is what they're really trying to do and, and you shouldn't be scared by it and we can figure out a pathway here that you can still uh, buy it. And then we went to the company and sort of said, hey, you don't realize this, but you just scared you know, the end user to death and they were about to walk away from this uh, uh, deal here. But if you make, if you change the language here a little bit, you'll, you'll make them feel a lot better. And that's just an example of uh, what I would call this defrictionizing process here, where we hold the hands of both sides, we're trusted by both sides, both the end user and the portfolio company, to really help them understand this is how you work together well. And that's the secret sauce, I think, of Enkito. Yeah, I think I've always explained you guys as like a little bit of like the, the Cracker Jack decoder ring. Yeah where you're able to sort of just understand things that might be seemingly in a, in a different language. The, the, old, the old joke we like to make is government loves to throw out this phrase COTAR, which is, you know, contractual uh, resource term. And, you know, people in Silicon Valley think they're talking about some Klingon uh, warrior princess. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> some sci-fi thing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So for like an organization that's sitting out there or an early stage founder that's maybe pure commercial, yeah. they're just, they're seeing sort of the hype right now around defense and Oscar. Like, how do they think about you? How do they get smart about you? When should they reach out? Like, you know, for, for those listening who are that sort of captive audience that maybe your team hasn't found yet, you know, what's, what do we say to them? Right. So, so look, uh, first of all, we're open for business. So we, we love inbound requests. The easiest thing to do is there's an email info at uh, iqt.org. The more, you know, likely path of success, right, is to figure out how to connect on LinkedIn to one of the people on the Inkitel investment team and get some sort of warm introduction to us. But, uh, you know, we we look at it as our job is to look at everything. So we will we will look at everything that, that uh, that's out there and give it consideration and try and give you actual feedback of whether we're interested or not. And if not, you know, uh, why not? Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a good, just to, to frame that for folks listening, like, if you've got an idea, you think you've got something that's interesting or a fit, like, Hit them on LinkedIn. Hit them on the website. Yeah. Like it is yeah, not right. this very difficult sort of labyrinth of like literally shoot shoot them a DM. Yep. Um, I think sometimes people might not 
might not realize that like when you say open for business, it's very traditional. We're open for business and we're accessible by design. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's very easy to find any of us on, on LinkedIn and, and, and we absolutely, uh, we want to hear from you. Yeah. Um, so two, two last questions. Um, and I know sort of, we've just come out of another event that you guys put together where we're, we're talking about a bunch of things we're seeing in the world, but I guess my, my thing is given your positioning, what piece of what trend or technology or, you know, interesting sort of phenomenon you, not the organization, like what are you most, what, what's got your attention right now? Well, look, I think what, what has my attention at the biggest, uh, highest level here is that, you know, I think the United States has never faced a more serious threat matrix than it has today, right? I mean, it has the conflict that's uh, going on in Ukraine, right? That's, you know, maybe escalating into sort of China versus Europe from some sort of proxy war battle. We got the conflict going on in Gaza, right? We got the potential conflict that seems to be increasingly more likely every day in the South China Sea. We have two peer or near peer competitors in China and Russia that are both adversaries of us and are getting closer together with each other. And then we have technology that's en enabling small groups of bad actors to do bad stuff around the world that we can't keep our, our eye off yeah. on as well. And everyone hyper wants powered to, individuals right, become yeah. like a huge problem right yeah, now. Yeah, right. Everyone yeah. wants to turn the page from global war on terrorism to nation state competition. And you can't lose sight of global war on terrorism, uh, I, I don't think. So, so it's an incredibly diverse set of threats that we're facing. And yet, one of the underlying themes to all that is Technology is changing the way conflict occurs, yeah. right? You know, and so if you look at the one lesson learned from both Ukraine and Gaza, I think is that the gap between the Davids and the Goliaths has shrunk because of uh, 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 commercial technology, right? No one really expected Ukraine to hold up against Russia, right? You know, and, and they have, right? And, and no one really expected Hama, uh, Hamas to present the threat to Israel that they've uh, pre presented here in this conflict. In in both cases. They're taking advantage of cheap, off-the-shelf commercial technology, uh, the, the uh, uh, Davids of the world, to go after the Goliaths, you know, uh, large, expensive, uh, exquisite connect platforms uh, that they have. So I happen to feel that what Inkytel is doing and what other groups in this, you know, space, DIU, OSC, AFWorks, you know, are, are all doing it is incredibly important right, right now. And, and then you... So that's what's happening at the kinetic level that, that we think about. The next thing I think about is from a strategic geopolitical level, China in particular is using commercial technology as a strategic lever in nation state competition, right? The wake-up call for all of us in, in, from that perspective was this realization that China was using Huawei uh, with its subsidy and support of Huawei as a way to uh, achieve geopolitical uh, uh, goals. And the U.S. had never really thought about commercial technology in, in that way. And now we have to do so. And that's why you're seeing things like the CHIPS Act and other sorts of uh, legislation being passed by, by Congress. And what policymakers in Capitol Hill and the White House are asking of the U.S. intelligence community these days is to provide them with some sense of what is happening in the commercial tech world. So policymakers on Capitol Hill in, in, in the White House, I think, are looking at the intelligence community and asking them to provide more intelligence on commercial technology and how adversaries might be taking advantage of us. And I think they've realized that Inkytel is a resource for them in terms of helping uh, understand where technology is going, what's quantum really going to be able to do, engineered biology, things like that, and also uh, uh, how adversaries may be taking advantage of them to project power and influence geopolitical events around the world. So you teased it a little bit on sort of the this 25 years, and you know, we just celebrated, you know, the 25th anniversary of Inkytel. So first, a congratulations for that. Um, you know, as you look out, towards the next one. I normally end these with, hey, you're king for a day. You could change anything, but we're gonna we're gonna go off script a little bit. What's the next like we're let's flash forward and we're at the 50th anniversary. King Steve is still sitting up there. You know, we've solved like nobody dies anymore, right? It's just your AI or whatever it is. You're playing implying otherwise I might be dead in 25 <laughs> years. <laughs> I'm seeing if you're paying attention. No, but so what what is what is Steve most proud of in 25 years at the 50th anniversary? What do you want that story to be? Yeah. So, look, I, I, I think at the most strategic, bigger, biggest picture level, what I want is the United States to continue to be the leader from an economic and national security perspective uh, uh, in the world. 
and they have done so by leveraging commercial technology in, in a way that has enabled them to maintain leadership positions in both areas. And InQtel has done our own small little part in helping them understand and take advantage of emerging commercial technology. If we've done that, we've done our job, and we can have another big party in 25 years. Yeah, uh, and I'll say maybe I mean, I'll drink a little less than uh, at one eighty. <laughs> fair, fair. But I'll say like I, I appreciate the practicality of the answer because I right. think there there's often sometimes to the chagrin of folks there's there's a lot of fanfare around like hey we're bringing all these constituencies yeah. together, but the ability to like deobfuscate yep. po- processes and attributes and different like actual applications of technology and capability right, um, is a very, very difficult task, and you guys make it easy. So thanks for doing what you guys do. Well, thank you, and, and thank you for being part of our portfolio and, and yeah. doing what you guys do as well. You, you know, you guys are going to have – are having already and will continue to have a big impact on, on, on everything that we're talking about here. Okay. Well, we're excited to be part of the team. Great. Thanks, right. Steve. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye.